Hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv. Now, you may be thinking, didn't Liv tell us this Friday would be an episode on Medea with Anwen Kaya Hayward? And yes, yes I did. But it turns out, even in all my attempts to finally be prepared for once, this has been the first ever instance of the audio I recorded with somebody being entirely unusable. Good times. So I hope to be re-recording with Anwen when we both have some time, but in the meantime, I do have lots of other fascinating conversations to put into your ears in its place. Today, I'm here with an equally exciting episode on an equally fascinating murderess from mythology, Clytemnestra. I spoke with Amy Hines, a woman much more educated in these things than myself, who has a particular interest in Clytemnestra, and we had an incredible conversation about the infamous woman from Sparta who killed her husband for very, very good reasons. One thing I do want to mention, you will hear Amy make reference to Clytemnestra's first husband and first child before Agamemnon. Now, this is actually a detail I was not familiar with before our conversation, but in Euripides' work, Iphigenia at Aulis, the play that tells the story of Agamemnon's murder of their daughter, Iphigenia, before the Greeks left for Troy, we learn that Clytemnestra was first married to a man named Tantalus, who was the son of Thyestes, a grandson of the infamous Tantalus, not that Tantalus himself. Together, they had a child. Before Agamemnon killed Tantalus as part of that family's curse slash blood feud, and then he also killed Clytemnestra's first child. Before, yes, marrying her. So this is something that doesn't come up in a lot of sources, but obviously when it comes to certain plays, like really contributes to her feelings towards Agamemnon. And so I think it's important, and I'm very glad Amy brought it up and basically taught it to me. It adds a horrifying layer to Clytemnestra's story, and I will absolutely be covering Iphigenia at Aulis in the very near future. But for now, on to my conversation with Amy Hines all about Clytemnestra. This is the Conversation Series. I promise we're not defending murder. Clytemnestra with Amy Hines. Well, I am here today with Amy Hines, who has come on uh, specifically to talk about Clytemnestra and everything that is, I don't even know how what words to use to describe her. I think she's wonderful, but I also will recognize she is also murderous, um, but I would say righteously, as much as you can be when you murder people. Um <laughs> So yeah, we're just going to chat all about Clytemnestra today um, for the wonderful series of International Women's Month episodes that I am covering this month. So thank you so much for coming on to chat. Thank you. And yes, I would agree that Clytemnestra is righteously murderous as well. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just say I love Clytemnestra and that like I think she was fully in the right. But I do think there's like ways to probably address the fact that like also you know, murder shouldn't happen. It is wrong. But also Clytemnestra was totally right in what she did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think um, she's she's definitely, unfortunately, dragged into a problem that is not hers. Obviously, the answer is not to murder your husband. Um, <laughs> but she she is literally has her hand forced, really, by the fact that she's kind of dragged into this curse of the house of atreus and she is pulled into it by the sheer fact that she's married to agamemnon and that's just kind of her bad luck really um and i although she's she is righteously murderous she shouldn't have murdered agamemnon 
but I think <laughs> absolutely she's a real tragic figure. It's a real shame how she's characterised in Greek, uh, in Greek theatre, because she's almost always mischaracterised. I would say she's never really given, apart from in Iphigenia at Aulis, she's never really given the space to be the tragic figure that she is. Yeah, that's very true. She's she's it's sort of all about her revenge against Agamemnon in theater versus how she got to that point and why which I, yeah is so much more so that's where all the complexity in her lies is sort of that interior everything that would have been going on within her throughout 10 years of Agamemnon being away at war and her slowly driving herself to deciding that that was the only option was to just get rid of him entirely yeah, I mean, I think the really sad thing about Clytemnestra, which it is very much there in sources that we have, quite easily available sources, is that she is just done over really by her circumstances. And all of the things that feed into why she murders Agamemnon are things that are not always related to her just sitting around for 10 years and waiting for him to come back and seething over the fact that he's uh, just sodded off to Troy. Um, so this is the obvious, which is uh, Agamemnon killing Iphigenia when, um, when he, before the ship sail off to Troy. And there's a really sad speech that Clytemnestra does in Iphigenia at Aulis where once she has discovered that it's all um, a big trick by Agamemnon so that he can get Iphigenia there to, to sacrifice her. She turns around to Agamemnon and says, well, you've already killed my first husband. You've killed my first child who was a baby. And now I've been this great wife to you. And now you want to kill another one of my children. And although she's not entirely sympathetic in Iphigenia at Aulis, so uh, she then goes on to talk about what a great wife she is in comparison to Helen, who is a horrible, wicked, adulterous wife. Um, it, it's really, it, the, what she says is really sad and really drives the point home. Agamemnon has tricked them, although he's, he's tried apparently to get the letter back that summoned them. He clearly didn't try that hard. Um, he has, he's summoned them to Aulis so that he can sacrifice Iphigenia, who is their daughter, and he's kind of forgotten that he's already killed one of Clytemnestra's children, he's already killed her first husband. And when you put it in those terms, you can really understand why she's so pissed off by the time he gets home. Um, it, it's just unthinkable, really, what she's been through already before the Trojan War even starts. And added to the fact that it just, this is just as part of the curse of the House of Atreus as as Agamemnon is. She's really just pulled into it from every side. It's very, very unfair. I do feel for her. Well, she also has sort of a background of issues with her sister and and everything to do with that. I mean, you know, she we don't have a lot that references them as children but we do know that basically every man in the whole of the greek world wanted helen and then one of them won her and then it was just kind of like oh well i guess his brother can have clytemnestra then you know it, it's it's so dark to think about that and obviously you know in in terms of like humanity she would have a lot of internal issues going on having that had happened to her and then just sort of being stuck with Agamemnon. Um, and then everything he does to her after that, you know, it sort of all falls on her in this very unfortunate way. She's had to take a backseat to Helen in a way that is not sort of denigrating Helen. I think Helen gets a massively bad deal as well. Um, but there's sort of the obvious fact that Helen is like the golden child. There's the mythology around Helen being the one of the divine children with Pollux and Clytemnestra being a mortal child with uh, with Castor. And uh, you're right, I think there's just a lot of sort of 
family. <laughs> there's a lot of family issues with <laughs> Dyson Lift, which are just totally not her fault. But even just the way that she's characterised in, in ancient material, the way that she's characterised in reception, it's just really unfair. I think the um, not many reception sort of practitioners really think about her characterization in ancient myth as as anything that needs to be questioned even um even in a thousand ships even in natalie haynes's book in the episode on iphigenia she's vain she doesn't notice that anything's wrong um she's really obsessed with being queen and that doesn't at all challenge what comes across through any of the playwrights it doesn't challenge particularly Aeschylus so Aeschylus is the worst of Clytemnestra he's horrible um and I, I do think this sums up a lot of the issues that we have when we're talking about women in myth so she's um in uh the Eumenides in Aeschylus's Eumenides which uh deals with Orestes, once Orestes has kind of run off and he has tried to escape his fate, having murdered his mother, it deals with his trial uh, by Athena, Apollo and the Furies. And both Apollo and Athena spend most of the trial being like, well, kind of doesn't matter that you killed your mom because uh, your dad's the most important one. And actually, it doesn't... she shouldn't take precedence because women just are vessels for children and it, it strips away a lot of what's important for Clytemnestra so the idea that she's just is a vessel to carry children also problematizes how she deals with Iphigenia because it's sort of implied that she she shouldn't have she shouldn't have really had the feeling that she had about Iphigenia because after all, she only carried her. She wasn't really an important parent. Um, she shouldn't have carried that through to revenge. Um, and I, I actually did my undergraduate dissertation on uh, Clytemnestra and Helen and their sort of place and their their representation of Spartan women. And it, Hesiod kind of sums up what Clytemnestra has to endure forever now so Hesiod says that he who believes a woman believes cheetahs and that for me encapsulates <laughs> what, what Clytemnestra has to go through up until now uh, absolutely so you know even when Odysseus is talking to Agamemnon in um in the underworld in the odyssey Mm. Agamemnon's like well you know what that horrible bitch she killed me no one should believe women because Odysseus definitely don't believe Penelope when you get back to Ithaca because god knows what she's been up to because my wife murdered me and it's a real shame that no one's kind of no one seems to be able to look behind this aspect of Clytemnestra where actually she does have all this contextual stuff it's not her curse the curse is uh, Agamemnon's and his family is and um she she does a terrible thing because she has just been pulled into this curse and all of her background everything that has fed up to the point where she murders Agamemnon has created her has created this event and she just honestly does not deserve (laughs) she doesn't deserve the way that she is characterized at all um because none of it I don't think is really her fault in many ways I think there's enough to say that she has enough agency to make this decision to murder Agamemnon which is obviously (laughs) unfortunate um but other than that I think even that I think often Aegisthus, Aegisthus's role in Agamemnon's murder is very often underplayed itself. So she's often given full agency in that when it is something that is not entirely her action either. Yeah, I I agree with all of that completely. I was going to bring up Homer as well because, yeah, in the Odyssey, she is she is portrayed so poorly, and it's just like laughable. Um, But in addition to everything that that you mentioned that Agamemnon says, he also really specifically says, like, my wife was awful, but you have one of the good ones. And, like, (laughs) suggests that Penelope, you know, is fine. And, like, Penelope, 
is is clearly a hundred times better than Clytemnestra, who was awful and look what she did and blah blah blah. And it, so it's just this gross comparison. Like it's not only a disgusting portrayal of Clytemnestra in general, but then it's this bizarre thing where it's like, oh, and your cousin Penelope, she is so much better, and she is a real woman, and she is what all women should be because you know. I mean, there isn't really even a because. I mean, in theory, the because is that she's been faithful, but Agamemnon doesn't know that. He's just like comparing them for no good reason and and suggesting that that Clytemnestra was just this this mess of a person. And I mean, as much as, you know, I think we should say that murder is wrong and technically she shouldn't have killed Agamemnon, what else could she have done in order to exact any kind of justice like not even retribution or revenge but justice for what Agamemnon did is like she didn't have any other kind of power she didn't have any ability to to punish him in any kind of um more you know legal in whatever sense they had in Bronze Age Greece kind of way she she could have killed him and that was about it because otherwise he would have come back and she would have just had to live with it and live with not only him being back having murdered their daughter but also him bringing back this poor woman from Troy who who didn't deserve that. And, you know, there's just so many things that if she didn't kill him, everything would have been completely for, horrific for her for the foreseeable future. And so, I mean, murder just simply seems like the best option. At least she had, I guess this there is like a bit of moral support. You never, I mean, the, the sources are sort of different in terms of who who kind of instigated it. I like to think that Aegisthus was kind of just around. That is one, that's one thing I did really appreciate in A Thousand Ships is how sort of the, like, she just sort of uses Aegisthus for exactly what she needs and then otherwise handles it all herself, which I, I enjoy that interpretation of her where she is the one who does it all versus, versus Aegisthus. Yeah, I think, um, as I said about I just, yeah, I think there's, there's something to be said, certainly in a, a modern sense, about her as a, a very kind of independent woman and taking taking control of the situation. And I absolutely agree that there is there is nothing else that she could have done to um, get any kind of justice. Certainly, the manner that she does it is questionable. So, the forcing, like forcing Agamemnon to commit some pretty serious hubris when he gets home, is a, <laughs> a bit sort of a, it's it's a bit overboard. Um, but I mean, again, she's she's reviled for murdering her husband, despite the fact that her husband has just returned from a war where he has murdered lots of people, and I think this is a kind of thing that we forget and we forget to contextualize it in those ways Agamemnon has done his own like he's had his own problems his family have definitely got their own problems and do they ever yeah and it's it's absolutely like she can't really win she's I think in many ways she's protecting herself she's obviously I would say protecting her other children considering that her husband has now murdered two of her children um and unfortunately she transgresses her gender most particularly by doing so and is therefore sort of out reviled in a way that is really overweighed by as compared to sort of other, other characters and i think the the other shame is how she's missed represented by even the gods i mean at the start of the humanity is she sort of uh she says that she's wondering and humiliation and held to blame and it's really sad if she knows kind of that she shouldn't have murdered agamemnon but she also knows that she didn't have any other choice um and she knows what it would do to her relationship with her remaining children i think she knows that it's that her children are not going to run to her and go oh my god thank you so much for killing dads before he could kill us so I think she she's well aware that she's between a rock and a hard place and again she is caught in this um in this curse where she can't do right for wrong really um but absolutely thinking in terms of her having to just deal with Agamemnon when he returned from Troy having to live with the man who has now murdered one husband murdered two children 
and returned for good measure with a, with a concubine who, you know, in herself has her own... Her, Cassandra also deserves <laughs> justice in this. Um, I, I, I don't see that she could have acted in many other ways, really, without us having to have a different conversation just about how she is purely a victim of Agamemnon, really. Yeah, that's very true. It, it would be a, a very different conversation. And I mean, I I for one love that we have the character of Clytemnestra and, you know, it would be brilliant if she were sort of more appreciated or understood in ancient sources and, and reception now. Um, but I mean, I, there are so few women in mythology that have this kind of complexity that you can see even, you know, beyond the sources that you can with you know it's it's one of those things obviously you know you you need to stick within sources generally but it's so easy with her to be able to see beyond them because the the story itself is so complex and there's so much going on that you can so easily see a true Clytemnestra versus how she's portrayed um and even just you know as a woman in ancient Greece but there are so few women who get these stories where where any kind of they get any kind of retribution or or power or you know i mean that's sort of the the ongoing thing that i experience in doing this podcast is like how how many women actually get you know what they deserve in a righteous kind of way and Clytemnestra and Medea are certainly sort of the <laughs> the top ones that come to mind for me of, and granted both are sort of received in similar ways of being portrayed as evil and monstrous. And, and I love them both for it immensely for lack of having anything more intelligent to say on the subject. I just love them. They're wonderful. I think um, Clytemnestra deserves to be spoken about alongside uh, Medea more often, actually, because there, there are a lot of similarities between them, as you point out. One of the reasons why Clytemnestra is left behind so often and why she's still mischaracterized, even in reception, I think is because the element of sympathy that Medea often has because of the children is not often thought about in Clytemnestra's terms. So despite the fact that she also loses two children, they she doesn't kill them herself, um, they're she's she's often seen in kind of the in very kind of polarized terms so it's almost like the death of Iphigenia and her murder of Agamemnon are separated in ways that often other tragic figures are, don't have separated for them they're very much things that happen at either end of the Trojan War and Perhaps because of what happens in the interim, where she uh, she remarries and she decides to uh, basically go, well, son Agamemnon, I don't care what he's what he's up to now. Um, it's like I think it's very much seen that those for me they're very obviously a cause and an effect, but I think often people don't see it that way. Um, it's like what happens beforehand shouldn't have shouldn't have affected what happens when he gets home, which of course uh, it will do because I know that if my partner murdered my two children after ten <laughs> years, I think I would chop. Yes, so um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think one of the one of the big problems is that she's not considered where she should be in comparison with other other mythical women who equally deserve our sympathy and need to be looked at through a critical lens. Um, I think sometimes, in some ways, she's comparable to Medusa in that way. Like Medusa, uh, as I know that you think as well, <laughs> clearly deserves uh, a better, <laughs> a better, much, much better rap than she gets often. Um, but I think it's it's possible to consider Medusa, even if you, even if, which is not my bag, but if you want to go down the route that she has spent a long time turning people to stone, um, there, you know, there's obviously she deserves some kind of justice because she was not at fault for what happened to her. And that's the way that I think of Clytemnestra. She was certainly not at fault for any of the things that led up to her 
deciding to take the decision to murder Agamemnon. And that's what is important for me. Obviously, murder's not the answer, but the (laughs) idea of getting justice for herself is really important. Um, And one other thing I would mention is that actually she has, she is given a bit of kind of power in Euripides. So in Iphigenia uh, at Aulis, she is the person who basically puts together the two things that actually Iphigenia is going to sacrifice. So it's because she won't leave. Uh, even though Agamemnon's like, don't worry, I'll sort everything out. The wedding's going to go smoothly. You can go home now. And it's because she's like, no, 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 this has to be done properly. And I'm going to carry the marriage torch. You know, go make sure everything runs smoothly. That she decides to go and speak to Achilles. And between them, they're like, oh okay we've both been done over here um so i think the idea of her as sort of this smart and powerful and it's this smart and powerful woman who does have some agency and does have sort of the ability to go past what go past what women is expected of women in the sources um is there already and unfortunately it's often overlooked especially in perception it's overlooked and if it isn't overlooked it's kind of over inscribed into her as this evil woman who's overconfident and vain and uh, jealous of Helen um and it's it's just a, a massive shame because she could I think very easily be very sympathetic and still be this really intelligent sympathetic person I don't think there is any need for her to be so sort of mistreated I guess well absolutely and I think the what you were talking about before too of of the idea of them it not often being connected that she kills Agamemnon because of Iphigenia to me it's like yeah there's 10 years in between but the 10 years were just spent stewing on it and that I think is why it's all so dramatic, right? That's why she forces him to commit this insane act of hubris, walking along the carpet and the whole thing. I mean, because she has spent 10 years thinking about it and then thinking about it more and then getting a little bit more angry about it every waking moment until the only solution is not only to murder her husband, but to do it in this way that makes him completely, you know, unforgivable to the gods and to everyone and just sort of, you know, it's the absolute worst thing or, you know, best punishment, really. The worst thing she could do is the best punishment for him. And and so it those 10 years are, you know, such a, a vital piece to why it is so intense the way she finally does away with him. And also, I just have to say, in your reference to her portrayal in Iphigenia at Alice. I think about this a lot, but thank God for Euripides, you know, and the women we have because of Euripides, and the way we can look at them, because at least, at least he wrote some female characters that are righteous and awesome. I mean, between that and Medea, it's like, I feel like we would, we would have so much less if it weren't for him. And also that his, so many of his plays did survive. Yeah. So um, I think, Although Euripides has obviously got his own uh, his own problem, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, he's not perfect, but <laughs> yeah, he, he's uh, he's not a fan of Helen particularly. Um, but uh, you're absolutely right. I think the just the nuance that he introduces into her character, and I I always find it really interesting that he, as someone who's revisiting an earlier episode, so. Euripides already has a Clytemnestra that's kind of been uh, been invented by Aeschylus and he's got the Sophoclean Clytemnestra and yet he goes back and he revisits this almost formational event for Clytemnestra and instead of making it something where we might expect from Aeschylus where she's uh she's not at all sympathetic he is he treats her in a really interesting way so 
um, the only problem that I have with uh, with her in, in Euripides really is her complete hatred of Helen as well, which I think, um, given that given that Agamemnon has married her after murdering her family and that Helen has been abducted. I think as a sister, her her reaction is probably more likely to be, even if she hated Helen, her reaction is probably more likely to be, oh my God, not not my sister as well, than kind of like, what, what an asshole, how dare she? Um, but I think that he, he adds a lot of nuance in it. I think he really makes us revisit Aeschylus and Sophocles with a critical and nuanced eye, because it's through looking at the European Clytemnestra that we can then go back to the Aeschylean uh, Clytemnestra and sort of go, well, actually, perhaps when Clytemnestra is running around as a ghost in the Eumenides, actually, we should feel quite sorry for her when Athena and Apollo are banging on about how it doesn't matter that there's a mom involved and actually, wow, well, we only rate dads, really. Um, it should make us feel really sorry for her. And, and that's something we don't get with kind of without Euripides. I'll admit it's been a while since I've read Iphigenia at Alice, and now you've made me want to go back to it. So, but I just, I mean, I think I, Medea is the one that's just most in my head. So all I can ever think is just that he, he gives us like real people as women versus so many of the others that are just sort of caricatures. But now I desperately want to read that play again. <laughs> um, but I always, yeah, I mean, the Helen stuff in so many of the sources is fascinating to me. And just the the sheer way in which she is hated, but then also the way, at least in Homer, the way in which she's just kind of completely forgiven once she's back with Menelaus. It, it, Helen in general is fascinating. And I I would love to know more about all the different um, sources we have on all the complexity of of her. I wish I'd read Iphigenia and Alice before this conversation because I'm most of what I'm taking in is is based off what you're what you're saying and my vague memory of it. Everything I've read recently has been um, Homer because I've been um, just doing bonus episodes of where I read the Iliad, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and um, and so I everything that's so stuck in my head is, is of his interpretation of of everything, which is of course so peripheral, and then fascinating to me how it all kind of expanded into you know I mean the other sources we have certainly but the when it comes to the more mainstream ones the plays that sort of take these minor anecdotes because certainly in in Homer Clytemnestra is portrayed very poorly but she's also portrayed as such like a minor character um and then even just that that whole episode is so minor. It's so much like, I mean, it's referenced a couple of times in the Odyssey, but it's like, well, Agamemnon went home and look what happened to him. And then him in the underworld of, oh my God, look what happened to me. <laughs> and then <laughs> expanded upon into these plays that now we have, I mean, so much more to talk about, but also all these different ways in which characters, but specifically women are treated. Um, when I was in university uh, for my undergrad, I took a Greek drama class that focused exclusively on um, the plays surrounding that story. So, you know, we read Aeschylus' Oresteia, and then we read um, Sophocles' uh, Electra, and Euripides' Orestes and Electra, and and just kind of examined how each of them handled the story. And I wish I still had my notes from it so long ago now. But, uh, I mean, I'm, so, uh, I'm thrilled that that was a class where you just really – look so deeply into how each one of them handled it because they all handled it so differently and and gave such interesting uh focus onto different areas and different characters and then of course yeah we didn't we didn't study Iphigenia in in that version or in that class but but even just you know the the Clytemnestras across the the playwrights and the Electras across the playwrights it's a fascinating 
way in which the the ancients even just examined these stories that were, you know, originally so old but so minimal. Yeah, I think that's one of the um that's kind of one of the big problems we have with Pelican Letter is that particularly as um most of the sources that we have obviously not being anything approximating original and in themselves being receptive and being made to be useful and sort of comprehensible for the time and place that they were being written and performed they have their own agendas and Clytemnestra is a woman who has committed murder not just a murder but the murder of her husband and the master of her house as Athena says is irredeemable so however they use Clytemnestra what whatever sort of however they want to use her as a vehicle she is not really redeemable and that's what makes Euripides quite interesting because he to a certain extent does redeem her and actually uses her to bash Helen a bit um, in making her sympathetic. So it, that is one of the big difficulties is the fact that the sources do just kind of take things that, as we go through time, are kind of just marginal or snip it here and snip it there, and they build their own stories around them. I think that one of the one of the interesting things I, I keep coming back to the Aristia because one of the interesting things for me in that is the way that she's used the way that her death is literally used as kind of this explanation of the judicial system being invented in Athens and it's the, for me is the fact that even in Aeschylus even though Aeschylus clearly hates Clytemnestra she's still quite a difficult to deal with figure there is still the fact that he gets a whole play out of the arguments about whether or not Clytemnestra was right to kill uh, Agamemnon because it's already laid out that Orestes is right to kill Clytemnestra but wrong to kill his mother um and it, it's the same. Uh, Clytemnestra does get the same sort of. Um, she gets the same sort of consideration. She's right to kill Agamemnon. Like after all, he's not related to her. One of the characters says she's she's not his blood. Who cares? Um, but then that's when Athena comes in with. But she is married to him. He is her husband. He is her master. She definitely should not have killed him. Um, and it's nice to see that actually, it, despite the fact that she gets a really bad rap, when we really dig into the sources, she is often quite nuanced. She does kind of get this treatment where it's really understood that she kind of doesn't have any other option. Um, there are things that would absolve her. It's made very messy by the fact that she is killing her husband who is supposed to have ultimate power over her blah 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 but it it is not a cut and dried case that she just shouldn't have killed him it's very much I think lurking in the background that Agamemnon has done some wrongs to Clytemnestra and those wrongs are not always mm -hmm. the same they're not always clear but it's always there it's never just kind of like she definitely shouldn't have done that unless it's Agamemnon talking to Odysseus in the underworld in which case he is like she just shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah she definitely done, shouldn't have done that which of course is you know kind of fascinating in itself that he's the only one we have and obviously you know they, they weren't directly interconnected but like he's the only one directly saying that no it was all wrong it's like well you know you were the one who, were ki who was killed so you are going to say that of all people <laughs> I'm always so interested too in just kind of considering what I mean all, obviously all of these plays were written to an audience who knew the story and so you know what they what might they have understood and believed about the story that we don't necessarily know um and sort of what were the playwrights playing off of and either proving or disproving in that sort of general zeitgeist that existed at the time of of how these stories actually went down for the everyday person basically the crux of every one of my thoughts is I just want to go back there and, and know everything that everyone believed at any given time. Yeah, it's um 
it, it, it's interesting to consider what they would have been going in with knowledge of. And I think also uh, it's sensible to assume that they knew a whole story that we don't necessarily have access to mm-hmm. when we read the sources. But I think it's also really interesting to think what would they have been surprised by? Mm. So what what exactly are the innovations that the playwrights are putting in that would have made the audience go, oh, I didn't see that one come in. Um, and I think that... M- Certainly with Clytemnestra, I think that the slightly different characterizations of her across the plays make me think that there were definitely some moments that the audience would have been like, wow, I don't know where that came from. Um, but obviously, we don't know which moments they were. So it's, it is a shame, obviously, that we can't go back in time and go and find out what people what people were sitting there thinking that they knew. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's it's an interesting point that obviously people people had access or they knew a story already, that, and we just don't know which bits of the story they they were kind of having confirmed and which bits were innovations. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a very interesting point, and I also wish I could go back and watch, <laughs> although maybe not in my current form. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think about that a lot too. I'm like, I want to go back. Do I want to go back as a woman? I I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I'm wrong in. Well, I shouldn't even phrase it that way because then I might be. Um, but uh, we don't have a lot of sources on on their stories you know the whole of them beyond the plays and homer is that right there's i mean maybe later but that would have been written post the plays is there anything kind of in between that you know of no so as far as i'm aware uh it it would be mostly uh yes homer and then the plays it's certainly that's certainly what i'm familiar with anyway mm-hmm. and then um a lot of the information that we have preserved is then obviously preserved in Latin epic and yeah and poetry and whatnot, um, which is a whole different ball game in itself. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's that's that is obviously one of the issues as well is that we're just kind of extrapolating from like tidbits here and there in what we've got preserved. Um, and obviously, we we know that they had lots more that was written down and. The other issue is, of course, the we don't know how much else was preserved in oral tradition. Mm-hmm. So uh, we are just unfortunately missing missing so uh, much. So much. <laughs> it's just so much. <laughs> uh, as I said, I, I did my dissertation on uh, on Clyde Mister and Helen, and Hermione as well um, mm. as Spartans, Ooh. and I think there is some interesting stuff to be said about how Helen um Clytemnestra sorry but Helen as well is badly characterized because of her Spartanness um so a lot of her a lot of the things that she is sort of denigrated for are connected to ideas about Spartan women so like she's licentious and she's um she uh, she leads almost a gynecocracy, if I pronounced that right. <laughs> um, and um, she's just generally sort of she's she's very representative of what what comes out about beliefs about Spartan women. Um, and it's interesting because I I concluded in the end that one of the reasons why that is is because the reason why that she's mischaracterized is because she moves away from Sparta so where Helen gets to stay in Sparta and be a Spartan woman uh Clytemnestra has to move away and go and live with Agamemnon and all of those things that are supposedly Spartan characteristics are no longer acceptable outside of Sparta so I personally I'm although it was my undergraduate dissertation I'm very protective of it um (laughs) and I do think that there is something in there I think that a lot of a lot of the reasons why particularly in uh fifth century plays why she is so denigrated is because she has this link with Sparta obviously the Athenians uh were aware of this link with Sparta um and I think sometimes that's why they see her as irredeemable because 
she is behaving in a way which links her to her home city but which is not acceptable outside of her home city so a lot of the beliefs about spartan women are kind of just like well spartan women act that way because they're just allowed to in sparta um and that clearly is not the case for clytemnestra so she's i think there is sort of a an opinion that she is behaving in a way that is no longer appropriate because she's no longer in that place that is really fascinating and I had never well I don't know enough about the historical things like that but that's a fascinating way of of looking at her and of Spartan women in general something I I don't consider enough um how much did you learn about Hermione she's so fascinating but I feel like there I've come across so little about her um so I didn't get a huge amount about her and I'll be honest it's not something I've revisited uh really but she does come up in some of the plays um and there's some interesting stuff again Hermione is uh quite characterized as being a a Spartan girl in herself um she is married off to the son of Achilles which is quite appropriate for a Spartan Mm -hmm. a Spartan girl well because now that you're saying this because she does after Neoptolemus dies, does she she marries Orestes, right? Is that a thing? She does, yes. In <laughs> Andromache, um, Neoptolemus is uh, is so Andromache is Neoptolemus' is concubine, and Hermione is married to Neoptolemus, but Hermione um, has a go at Andromache for because she thinks that she's poisoning her, so that she can't have any children. Um, and obviously that's quite problematic generally for a Greek wife. Um, but it's also problematic in terms of Hermione as a kind of a, a cult figure in Sparta. Um, so in Sparta, historically, there is like a cult of Helen, um, which is uh, related to child uh, childbearing, I think. And... Um, I'm sure that my supervisor of my undergraduate dissertation will will listen to this <laughs> and correct me <laughs> vociferously if I'm wrong. But there is a sort of Helen, and um, the fact that Hermione hasn't had any children is quite terrible for her as a Spartan woman. Mm. Um, so there's sort of quite a lot to be said about them as women who come from Sparta but in terms of Hermione herself there's not a there's not a huge amount on her but she does crop up um and she also is kind of dragged into this whole curse of the house of actress through Orestes um mm. who does go and carry her off and get married to her in the end which I'm sure she doesn't enjoy at all, frankly. Yeah, that that carried her off term. (laughs) Gotta love it. Mm. (laughs) Covers a multitude of sins. Uh, Well, that's, that's, I love hearing that extra information about Sparta. That's something I hadn't thought. I mean, obviously, you know, them being Spartan is such an important part of the story, but I feel like it's not... It's not often brought up like what that actually means and what that implies, especially because the plays were written in Athens. You don't you don't get a lot of the Spartanness of it all. Yeah, I think it adds it adds to kind of another dimension to Euripides' sympathetic portrayal because uh as a character who is Spartan and who the audience would have known is Spartan, um, it's quite interesting that he is so sympathetic. At, but it does say a lot about that we're not as the audience supposed to read her in that moment necessarily as a Spartan woman Mm -hmm, right so it does give us a a lot of context about actually who we're supposed to read as as what and where although I definitely think that it affects the representation of her in the earlier plays just the residual idea of her as (laughs) as a Spartan woman uh, overstepping her bounds not only as a woman but as a, a Spartan woman who's no longer in Sparta and shouldn't be shouldn't be misbehaving like this anymore mm-hmm. so yeah I think um I think uh, I think certainly that her Spartanness is quite important to her portrayal yeah absolutely I have to say I 
I don't know if it's a Canadian thing or just a my university thing, but I just didn't have to do a dissertation or any kind of like specialized anything in my undergrad. I just had to like take the necessary courses and and graduate. And at the time I thought that was great. And now I'm like, son of a bitch. I wish I'd like actually (laughs) been able to focus in on something and have this kind of like that, that kind of very specific thing to call on, you know, like I have some papers that I wrote that I I can remember fondly and, and think back to what I learned and but I never had to do anything that extensive. And I wish that I had. <laughs> it came out of a very um, uh, a weird spot, actually. One of my, I did my uh, undergraduate um, degree distance learning. So I had all the mm. books sent to me. And I noticed this little line. We had a, a model on Sparta and there was a little line about Helen. And I was like, hmm, actually, it's quite interesting thinking of her as a, as a Spartan. Um, so it kind of grew out of, a lot of thinking around um and I I later compared the last part of it I compared uh kind of the philosophy and uh some of the some of the other writings so Thucydides, Xenophon and Herodotus and their kind of views about the Spartans and compared it to the characterization then of the Spartan women from Homer um, with the argument, which I'm not convinced by necessarily by the argument anymore, that the kind of Spartan mirage has this earlier start point than we necessarily think it does. But I definitely think that even even in Homer, you can start to see these uh, stereotypical Spartan women's characteristics coming out, which if not if not as the start point of the spark mirage it certainly says something about how long these stereotypes have, have gone on for um although arguably they are a lot of them are just stereotypes about women but the fact that a lot of some of them are stereotypes specifically about spartan women which spartan women are, are supposed to be able to get away with in sparta is quite interesting when uh, particularly when you consider that helen gets off totally scot-free even even in the least ambiguous versions where she's just gone willingly with Paris she just comes home and puts her feet quite literally puts her feet up and <laughs> just cracks on with it yeah um, that it's very interesting when she goes back to Sparta whereas Clytemnestra is obviously not in Sparta and all of those kind of bad behaviours which are comparable with Helen, we call them bad behaviours, are comparable with Helen, are punished essentially. I mean even um, Clytemnestra is really notably not beautiful, she's very, uh, she's kind of denied beauty throughout uh, throughout the epics and the plays. Um, and then itself is quite interesting because Spartan women, one of the positive things about Spartan women is they are famously beautiful. Well, Helen is obviously the most beautiful woman in the world and she lives in Sparta, whereas Clytemnestra has had to leave. And it's almost like some of her, um, some of the positive attributes are stripped when she leaves Sparta and she's just left with all these negative Spartan attributes mm. whereas Helen gets the full range of all the worst and all the best um, including things like physical fitness and beauty um, and it comes out in the men as well because Menelaus kind of takes on some Spartan attributes mm-hmm. so in uh, in battle in the Iliad he's Menelaus of the loud war cry um, so there's, I think there's like some some interesting stuff in there, um, particularly when you kind of think about it. It doesn't really make sense necessarily where wives and husbands go when they get married. So I know that there's theories about the idea of it being uh, matriarchal and that uh, that husbands are supposed to come in to the, to live with their wives, like it's supposed to have happened with Penelope. But that doesn't necessarily make sense because otherwise you would end up with sickies with loads of heroes in or lots of the wives coming into cities. So there's not necessarily any rhyme or reason that I'm aware of that that happens. But then I think a lot of it just happens with the needs of the story. Then it makes sense that those people would take on the attributes of certain places. So it makes total sense to me that Menelaus takes on some spartan attributes um while Clytemnestra 
is not allowed to take the good ones with her and is just left with all the bad ones and mm-hmm. duly duly punished for them well and even menelaus doesn't he he somewhat escapes the curse too by yes by becoming spartan i mean yeah that's fascinating yeah i hadn't thought of that i love this this is so much information i'm learning especially all the spartan stuff i need to look more into the history and all of that i don't i don't know half as much as i would like well i'm glad i asked then if you had anything more that you wanted to talk about because that added so much to it (laughs) thank you so much for talking to me amy this has been really fascinating and so entertaining thank you thank you for having me (laughs) So very happy to. I put out this call and I got such an incredible wealth of wonderful people to talk to all about these women. I'm just, I'm so excited. It's, so you're the the start of what will be a very exciting month. Well, I look forward uh, to, um, I look forward to hearing the others. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, nerds. Thank you all so much for listening. You can follow Amy on Twitter at Amy underscore Hines. You can find it linked in the episode's description. And on her Twitter, you'll see she even has a pretty incredible Etsy shop of mythological prints that are absolutely gorgeous. I hope you enjoy these conversation episodes. They will feature us the Friday episodes throughout March, like I said earlier this week, and they'll be scattered into the podcast amongst other reading series going forward. They're an incredible way for me to learn more, for you to learn more, and for me to amplify the voices of some incredible people working in the field. We all win, and it's awesome. If you're enjoying these episodes or the podcast in general, please do leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, even if it's not where you listen. It helps immensely. If you don't like me or the podcast or these episodes, simply don't leave a review. It's that easy. Thank you all so much. You are the best. Back soon with more badass women of mythology. I am Liv and I love this shit. Mm